Mr. Majeski's Anatomy Class Lecture, Chapter 7, Part 3, Vertebral Column and Thoracic Bones. So, one very fascinating bone is the hyoid bone found in the throat. And it is the only bone that does not have a joint. So it is the only bone that does not articulate with another bone. And instead, it is an attachment site for the tongue and muscles of the neck. If you look at it, you see that it has a body, uh, a lesser horn, and a greater horn. The vertebral column. The vertebral column consists of seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, one sacrum, and one coccyx, with the intervertebral discs that are located between the vertebrae. The intervertebral discs are composed of fibrocartilage, and that allows it to endure compression and shock absorption, so you can sit down really hard and not have all your bones click together. Um, it has a fibrous outer layer and a nucleus uh, that's more pulpy in the middle. Now, when you look at the vertebral column, you see that it actually has some naturally occurring curves. So the cervical curve is sort of convex, while the thoracic curve is somewhat concave, the lumbar curve is somewhat convex, and then the sacrum and coccyx forms the sacral curve, which is somewhat concave. So I was worth pointing out that the sacrum and coccyx are actually bones that were originally separate vertebrae. So for instance, the sacrum is formed by five fused vertebrae. Now, sometimes you can get spinal abnormalities where the curvature is incorrect. So, for instance, you can have scoliosis where you have a lateral curve, most likely in the thoracic area. You can have kyphosis, which is where you have an overly concave portion along the thoracic region. This forms sort of a hunchback. And then you can have lordosis, which is you have an or overly convex curve in the lumbar region. So, the woman in in the picture for the lordosis actually is not pregnant. Those are her abdominal organs pushing forward. So let's look at the typical generic vertebra. You see that it has a quite a few surface features that are very important. For instance, you have the vertebral body, which is the bulk of the vertebra. It then moves out to the pedicle. The pedicle is the region between the vertebral body and the transverse process. And from there you have the lamina that leads to the spinous process. So it goes vertebral body to pedicle, pedicle to transverse process, transverse process to lamina, and lamina to spinous process. And then basically a duplicate on the other side. Bilateral symmetry, everyone. The hole that the spinal cord is going to go through is called the vertebral foramen. And the vertebral foramen has a curve that's referred to as the vertebral arch. So the vertebral arch is going along the pedicle, transverse process, lamina, spinous process sort of area of the vertebral foramen. Looking on the side, you also see that when you put two vertebrae vertebrae together, you end up forming a hole, and that's referred to as the intervertebral foramen, or if you have multiples of them, which you will along the whole column, they would be collectively known as the intervertebral foramina. Now, in the pedicle area, right here, you will find an inferior notch and a superior notch. So again, the pedicle is here with an inferior notch and a superior notch. What you also will find is a superior articulating facet on the superior articulating process and an inferior articulating facet on the inferior articulating process. So a key thing to remember here is when we're talking about superior and inferior, we're talking about an individual vertebrae and whether it's at the top or bottom, superior or inferior, on that vertebrae itself. And also, it's key to remember that a process is something that sticks out. It's composed of bone tissue, while a facet is the site where two bones are coming together to form a joint of some kind.
So here are the seven cervical vertebrae, and they are labeled C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. Who would have guessed? The first two, though, have their own names. So C1 is also known as the atlas, and C2 as the axis. So when you look at a cervical vertebrae, it has a few features that you only find in this part of the vertebral column. It has a bifid spinous process, so it actually has two protrusions coming out of the spinous process. Within the transverse process, you will find a transverse foramen, so it'll have these extra holes. Now, when you look at the atlas itself, it has a few features unique to it. For instance, in the front, it has an anterior tubercle. It has the anterior arch, and then a posterior tubercle with a posterior arch. It also has a two lateral masses on each side with a superior articulating facet. This superior articulating facet is what is interacting with the uh, occipital condyles of the occipital bone. This is where the skull is resting on the vertebral column. C2, the bone uh, directly inferior to the atlas is the axis. Some key features of the atlas is the vertebral body. What directly on top of that is what's referred to as the dens. The dens is this part that sticks up, and the axis is actually going to um, protrude up and allow the atlas to sit on top and swivel around that dens. And that allows us to shake our head no. Move on down to the thoracic vertebrae. We will see that they have a few features unique to them. And this specifically relates to facets where they are articulating with the ribs. So as you can see, the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae will have a transverse costal facet that is going to articulate with the tubercle of the rib. And it'll also have an inferior and superior costal demifacet that's going to articulate with the head of the rib. If you look at the lumbar vertebrae, they don't have so much unique features as they lack those other features that you see in the cervical vertebrae and the thoracic vertebrae, and they are the largest of the vertebrae since they're holding up the most weight. So you have cervical vertebrae with their transverse foramina, and bifid processes. You have the thoracic vertebrae with their transverse uh, costal facets and their superior and inferior uh, demifacets. And then the lumbar vertebrae, which are just big. Inferior to the lumbar vertebrae is the sacrum and the coccyx, or tailbone. The sacrum has a lot of features of its own. It has this big strip referred to as the body, which would correspond to the body of the vertebrae that it originally was before they fused. At the very superior end, you have the superior articulating process where the vertebral column is resting. And this process is on the base of the sacrum. You also have flaring out the two sacral ala, one on each side. The base and superior articulating process rest on top of the sacral promontory. And then on the very edges, you have the auricular surface, which is articulating with the uh, oscoxy, or the pelvis. Now along the body, you've got these transverse lines, basically where the fusion occurred between the vertebrae back when we were fetuses. And you also have the anterior sacral foramen, or holes, that you can see along the sides. And at the very bottom, you have the apex of the sacrum. Now, if you look at the posterior side of the sacrum, here you can see the sacral canal. This is the opening, the superior end, where nerves will be traveling through the sacrum. It also has a lateral sacral crest running on the lateral sides, and a median sacral crest running along the midline. You also will find the sacral hiatus, which is the inferior opening that allows the nerves to cut, pass through. And then the postal sacral foramen. So note, if you're looking on the po posterior side, you have posterior sacral foramen. 
If you're looking on the anterior side, they're referred to as anterior sacral foramen, but they are the same holes. Isn't that great? All right, the thoracic bones, the ribs and the sternum. So the sternum is a flat bone. It has three main regions, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. The manubrium has the clavicular notch where the clavicles can in articulate, and then the suprasternal notch, supra above the sternum. Then the sternal angle is where the, where the manubrium uh, transforms into the body of the sternum, and then the xiphosternal joint, where you then trans uh, go from the body to the xiphoid process. Ribs. There are 12 ribs on each side, giving us a total of 24 ribs. The first seven ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, are true ribs because their costal cartilage that they attach to attaches directly to the sternum. The remaining five ribs, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, are referred to as false ribs because they do not attach directly to the sternum. As a matter of fact, the last two ribs are also known as floating ribs because they don't have any costal cartilage to speak of at all. The costal margin is the edge down here of the um, costal cartilage that forms for the uh, first three false ribs, 8, 9, 10. And then the space between the ribs is referred to as intercostal space. If you look at the ribs in themselves, they have the costal end, which is the facet for the costal cartilage. They have a long body. Then there's the costal groove, which uh, is present. And then they'll get the costal angle as the rib curves. This will lead to the tubercle, which is this bump here that has an articular facet that is going to interact with the transverse facet of the uh, vertebrae. It has a neck, a head, and on the head are two little facets that are going to articulate with those demi facets on the vertebrae. So here you can see the articular facet of the tubercle of the rib articulating with the transverse costal facet of the vertebrae. And you see where the head of the rib will interact with both the inferior and superior uh, costal demi facets on the thoracic vertebrae. And that's it for this chapter.